What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Sheehan Show here on Shardog.com. My name is Sean Sheehan, and today I'm looking ahead to Cage Warriors 164, which goes down in the tune over in Newcastle in the UK. And I'm joined, as always, by my co-host here on the Cage Warriors preview show, uh, Cage Warriors play-by-play guy and all-around wizard, Brad Wharton. Brad, how are you? How are, how are things? It's another, another, another very good card for us to preview here after a few good cards. You must be a... I, I know it's been a, a very busy period, but having great cards like this coming up to Christmas, with Christmas, I suppose, ahead as well, and something to be able to look forward to, it's a good time, isn't it? Great time. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to have an embarrassment of riches, isn't it? You know, there, there are worse problems to have than having to do sick fight cards every couple of weeks, uh, getting to enjoy Mr. Ian Dean's handiwork. On uh, on our screens, so yeah, it's been uh, it's been a crazy uh, couple of months. I think Cage Warriors has done a show every two weeks from September all the way through to the middle of December. So it's been uh, it's been a pretty hectic run, and uh, yeah, a couple of months off, and then we'll be uh, we'll be kicking off the twenty twenty four World Tour. Can't beat it. I there was one question I wanted to ask you. I listened to you. You did a great podcast with my colleague Ian O'Neill over in uh, on Severe Met talking about your uh, your your decade of of Cage Warriors commentary and uh, congratulations on that decade as well. Fair pleasure. But I was watching the fights last weekend and watching the the main event right, and it's it was such like a pretty beautiful knockout that I I kind of thought to myself. As someone who watches fights all the time and maybe doesn't appreciate it, as someone who's right up alongside it all the time, like when I'm right up alongside it, I feel like I appreciate it a lot because I do it maybe like three times a year or whatever. And it's still a bit odd to me, but it's not odd to you. Like you do, you do it all the time when you're there for a knockout like that in the main event, that beautiful left hook that we kind of even predicted a little bit that we had talked about. Is it still as Sean, great? I'm going to stop one? you there, Go by on. the way, because I did ask you for some lottery numbers. And oh. the fact that I, the fact that I'm still here talking to you now means they did not come. Oh, out. No. <laughs> um, I unfortunately, never. I won't be getting the uh, I won't be getting the Christmas beers in Tahiti. But anyway, I, I haven't I haven't checked them yet. I haven't checked them. Maybe they, maybe they come true in Ireland. Who knows? But that knockout, like I I know it's funny because you have to keep like obviously a level of professionalism and you have to keep the call going and all. But the level of excitement for you being like right alongside an unbelievable knockout like that, it like. Is it the same as day one? Is it like, have you had to like cool yourself down maybe even to be remain more professional? Something like that. What, what's it like? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you definitely uh, get carried away in the moment sometimes. I mean, the one I always sort of go back to is that Reed Wood. Uh, like the atmosphere in that building was absolutely electric. And I think if you don't get a little bit excited and carried away by that, then, you know, you probably should check your pulse and get, get to the nearest hospital uh, as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, like, you know, th- there was a funny video that, um, that the guys with the, you know, the commentator cam caught a while back on the broadcast. Uh, I think it was when Jimmy Wallhead knocked out Matt Figlack and I, I just sort of, my expression just didn't change. And I think it was Harry Williams just tweeted underneath it. Like, yeah, that guy's seen some shit over the years. <laughs> <laughs> so you, de- I think you definitely become a bit desensitized to it. And obviously like, you know, if you, if you're doing a, you, know, you might be doing five hours of commentary, six hours of commentary, maybe on a, on a big card. Uh, you know, you have to kind of level yourself off. But, you know, like that, that main event, you know, if you're not kind of what's going on here when you see something that cool, then, uh, yeah, you may be in the wrong job, I think. Yeah, it's it's funny how quickly we actually do become desensitized to, like, violence. Even, like, on a night out, you see some lad walking past with a fucking, you know, a bloody head or something. Like, oh, yeah, and then other people are, like, freaking out. Let's get away from here. I, I, I feel like uh, MMA people are uh, we're, we're a bit cracked, but sure, look, we have to be <laughs> to, 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 to be in this job, I suppose. But, yeah, it was a great card last week, and uh, let's, uh, let's move forward and talk about the, the card this week. First of all, the fans in Newcastle, like oh, it feels like for a long time MMA kind of in the north of England was something that was almost avoided for a while there was like I remember talking about the north of England about, about uh, like Scotland too it's like hard to sell tickets there and all this but it feels like that has changed and it feels like especially like in, in the Newcastle area they've had a few stars over the last while um, like everything is picked up every promotion kind of wants to go there every promotion has gone there over the last while and like as someone who's obviously a big uh, Premier League fan and all you know the Newcastle fans are, look 
you could argue they're the best fans in England. Like there's no, there's no doubt about it in terms of the sport fans, in terms of soccer fans. What's it like calling the card there? What are what are the fans like? What, what, I suppose what's the expectation of the crowd when you get there? I suppose I suppose it's it's as mental as as you'd expect, is it? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's our first show back in Newcastle in nine years, so you know, nearly a decade now since we last went. But uh, I remember the last event we did there vividly. It was um, we did like a double main card, so we had we had two separate main cards and then prelims in the middle, which which was quite cool. Um, so we had the Alex Enland Nad Naramani title fight, which is a really really good fight. Um, you know, if you ever stuck for one to watch on Fight Pass, fire that one up. A good five rounder, uh, and then we had Stevie Ray versus Kurt Warburton three. I believe was the the second main event. Uh, Paddy Pimblett was on the card. Um, you know, some some really really good fights, and the, and the, the crowd absolutely brought it. You know, it was a lo- it was a long day, uh, and it's going to be a long day on uh, on Saturday as well. We've got uh, I believe nineteen or twenty fights in total are going to be on this card. Um, so yeah, we're expecting the fans to bring it. You know, I'd love to tell people to go and buy a ticket, but I believe by the time this goes out, it's going to be sold out. Um, it, it's 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 gone phenomenally well. Um, you know, we had we had really really strong numbers as soon as we announced it, and I, I think when tickets went on sale, we only had the Chris Bungard uh, Perry Goodwin fight announced, and, and tickets were sort of flying off the shelves. So um, it's going to be completely sold out. Uh, there's no more room to add any more seats. So um, you know, you might get lucky if you if you listen to this one to buy a ticket, but otherwise, going to have to get that old time machine fired up and uh, spin yourself back to September to get hold of one. And that's, uh, I suppose that's good for the fans there. Probably won't be uh, nine years again before Ken Dwyer's come back, you know. And it's, it's I think that's, a, an, a, a, I suppose, an honest worry for a lot of fans as well. Because, like, we don't know the situation with a lot of the, the promotions in, in Europe at the moment. Like, you know, and, and it's it's good to see Ken Dwyer's going back. And I'm sure if you're a fan in uh, in Newcastle, you're probably thinking to yourself, I, you know, I want to buy a ticket here to prove that there's a great fan base here that promotions will keep coming coming back and I think cage warriors have done their part as well with uh, two title fights here and a very good card as well let's talk about the bantamweight title fight Liam Gittins versus Reese McEwen um, like you, you look at Reese McEwen 7-1 and one and you're you're kind of thinking to yourself you know when you when you look at that before you go back and look at the fights is there enough experience there but what he's done I suppose in those seven fights has like I think he has become more and more mature all the time. Like watching a couple of his early fights, um, it felt like it felt like he was kind of rushing things a little bit, even though he was winning, even though there's like an obvious athleticism there and all of that. But in in his last fight, um, you know, even though it only went into the the second round, you could see there was something different kind of coming there I, I I don't know if and it's funny because there's a lot of, obviously he's very good at wrestling he's very good takedowns but I, I thought there was a touch of like a switch stance kind of wide karate base kind of coming after watching a couple of these early fights and it's more of like a straight up boxing base and I'm it must be interesting for his opponents as well, considering like, well, what are we actually going to get from this guy? He's only eight fights into his career. Like people have massive changes in their game that, that early. And for someone already so talented, it must be very difficult. But first of all, Henri McCune, like what a talented guy he looks. And it's exciting to see someone like this. So young, I suppose, get into, uh, get into a cage warriors, uh, get into cage warriors title fight, Brad. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think the thing you have to um, remember with Reese as well is that he was a very good amateur. You know, he had some high level amateur fights, uh, you know, win over Kayla Locker in an amateur. Um, and he's done a lot of other stuff as well. He's done grappling. He's done kickboxing. He's done boxing, I believe, as well. Um, so it's, it's a guy with a lot of experience. You know, so the, the seven and one pro MMA record doesn't really do it justice. Uh, but like you say, you know, eight fights into his pro career and he is still evolving and he will continue to evolve. You know, he's training under... Uh, a very good coach in Dean Riley up the grip house. Uh, you know, got good training partners. He's got that kind of pedigree. You know, Dean obviously fought in Cage Warriors. Um, you know, Reese told me a great story about when, uh, I believe it was when he was turning pro and um, Dean gave him his old pair of Cage Warriors gloves that he'd worn in his Cage Warriors fight. And he said, you can have these as a loan until you get your own. And then obviously he's signed with Cage Warriors now uh, and he's got his own. But, you know, it's, it's great seeing guys with that pedigree. You know, we, we've talked about um, you know, guys before, like, you know, the guys coming through, Team KF, for example, you know, you've got Chris Fields, head coach, former Cage Warriors champion. He's been through that process. Um, you know, he knows how it works, knows how the game works, uh, and he knows what's required of his fighters. And, you know, you, you've seen that with Reese as well. He's got a good uh, relationship with, with, with Dean, his coach, um, and he's putting those game plans to good use. You know, I think last time out, 
you know, he knew there was a lot on the line. You know, the, he, he was supposed to, um, of course, he was originally supposed to fight Nathan Fletcher for the title here tonight. And, you know, the, he, he kind of knew that with a, with a win last time out, he was going to be in that position. So, you know, maybe that played into a little bit of the patience, a little bit more of a more measured approach that we saw. Um, but I'm, I'm very interested to see how he, how he uh, deals with Liam Gittins. You know, obviously in the back of his mind, he's thinking, I'm getting Fletcher. And it's a it's a very different kind of fight, but you know both these guys have had a bit of time to prepare for it, and uh, I I get the feeling something crazy is going to happen. I think the uh, the first round of this fight, you know, we we've seen it from Liam Gittins many many times. Uh, crazy stuff tends to happen in this fight, so I'm I'm very very excited to see how this one starts, just as much as how it finishes. A hundred percent, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But just on Liam Gittins, first of all, like I feel like we see s- certain guys in cage wires, and they have the you know some of them have the Ingarry Road, right, where you bowl through everyone and you go off sail off into the sunset right and some of them have it's even like a Paddy Pimlet road maybe where you lose one build your way back lose a couple build your way back again I feel like Gittins has kind of gone through that but you look like the names he has lost it's only been good names really like my guy Kingsley Crawford there's no shame in that uh, Gerardo Fanny who was you know fighting for the uh, fighting for the title around that, that stage as well but he's bounced back and he's won four in a row and he's done it you know relatively quickly two last year two this year you know, after losing twice in 2021, after fighting, sorry, losing three times in 2021, after fighting four times, like that, the mentality to do that, to bounce back like that. And as you said, you know, I, I watched one of his recent fights and you, you used the phrase swanging and banging about 10 seconds into the fight to be able to come <laughs> out and fight in such a confident way after getting your confidence knocked back. That is the like the brain power, the mentality to actually do that is phenomenal. But Liam Gittins only knows one <laughs> one way, doesn't he, Brad? And that is the the swang and the bang. Like it's not that he won't go for a takedown; he will go for a takedown as well. But it feels like he's just always fighting and he's always willing, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I, I love Liam Gittins as, as a fighter. You know, I think if you're um, if you're a fan of this sport. You want to watch entertaining fights? You could go. Uh, you could do a lot worse than watching uh, Liam getting his back catalogue. You know, he's always great value for money. Um, and you know, he, he he goes out in the shield. You know, when he, when he has picked up losses, as you say, he's only lost to really high level guys in Cage Warriors. And you know, he, he's never gone out with a whimper. He's always gone out with a bang when he's done it. And you know, from from a sheer entertainment point of view, I don't think you could ask for any more. You know, I, I was talking. I think I said after his last fight on commentary. Um, you know, he, he, we were talking about the featherweight division because obviously he's been fighting at, at 145 um, a little bit. And, you know, he's, he, he's always kind of gone up and down between the weights, even, you know, going back to being an amateur. And I was sort of talking about the Cage Warriors featherweight division. And I was talking about the Hendins and, and the Harillas and the Hardwicks and the Vucenics and obviously yeah, Paul Hughes at the time uh, and, and, and Charrier and, and all these big names. And I was like, wow, hang on, when are we going to start talking about Liam Gittins? Because he's on a four fight winning streak now. Like, this is a guy who, for me, he's, he's never more than a fight or two away from the top. Now, he's got this incredible opportunity. Um, you know, his teammate, Nathan Fletcher, who we will have been training with, who we will have obviously been intending uh, to, to help with the preparation uh, to fight Reese McEwen, uh, unfortunately not able to compete. And Liam Gittins gets the call and, and immediately says yes and, and steps in. So a huge, huge opportunity. And, you know, a, a guy like Liam Gittins is, is never going to choo- turn an opportunity like that down. And as I say, I, I am very, very much looking forward to this one. It's it's one of those fights that uh, the beginning, if you'd asked me at the beginning of the year who I thought would be competing for the Bantamweight title, I probably wouldn't have picked these two. But now it's here. I'm like, well, how did we ever not think of this? This is great. And some some fights like this are popping up more often because as we talked about last time look there's a huge turnover in in champions and cage warriors at the moment you know obviously Kayla Lochran uh, in this division going to the UFC and the former champion in this division going down and you know Ian Gary going to the UFC and and uh, Reese McKee going to the UFC and so many others over the last few years but like it's a massive opportunity for a guy. Like, like if Ken Lockham was still there, maybe a guy like Liam Gittins wouldn't get that opportunity. You know, and it's great to, to, to see it happening, I suppose. It's a very interesting melding of styles, I think, this one. Because it's like, you know, it's uh, not to go full Game of Thrones here or anything, but it's like ice and fire. You know, it's like one guy is swinging and banging and the other guy is trying to control it. You know, trying to... I was, I was watching one of um, um, Reese's fights uh, and it's like... His opponent was just coming out and was like, just going straight at him. 
And he was like, okay, go on, go on, come and kind of just, oh yeah, no, punch, punch away there, punch away. And he was just swinging with him and then he went in and got the takedown. Like, Gittens has to watch out for that too, but like, Gittens gets takedowns himself by going straight in like that, like the Ed Walls fight. Like, he just took him down over and over and over again with good takedowns inside. So, like, there is a very interesting game to be played here because both are good wrestlers. You know, um, uh, Reese McCune, I feel like. Is adjusting his style kind of on the go and on the feet. Let's see how that will work against the guy who's kind of put it out there for everyone to see in Liam Gittins and the fact that he'll kind of come forward and throw big shots at you. Like, will, will that kind of fast paced, all out game win over the kind of the cool cam game? Like, I don't know. It's a, it's a very hard one. Like, I, I think Reese McEwen would probably be a big enough favourite here, but I wouldn't re- rule out Liam Gittins at all. A little bit of maybe the uh, the Nicholas Alby fight from the last time we could see it here, but McEwen is, is, you know, he's a classy fighter too, and uh, I just, I love when styles like that happen, Brad. You must see it all the time. Like, one guy trying to fight like a very cool, calm, classic way, and the other guy trying to fight. Yeah, <laughs> you know? And uh, the... Those fights. Well, this this is the thing, you know. Like we, yeah. we know that Gittins has been in the trenches before, yeah. and we've seen him, and we've seen him pull, we've seen him pull it out of the fire in, in those situations. Um, you know, for Reese McEwen, he's probably not been in the trenches like Gittins has. So, you know, that again is a, is a really interesting wrinkle for this one. You know, I, I suppose you probably give Liam Gittins the edge in terms of like knockout power, and you know, if the fight ends up staying standing and and you know going into the third round, you, you maybe leaning towards giving Gittins the advantage there, just as you would maybe be leaning into uh, Reese McEwen earlier on, if he can get that dominant position on the ground, if he can get to the back, you may be leaning into Reese McEwen there. But as you said a couple of moments ago, this is what I love about this fight. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. And that's why, for me, this is like, this is the one to watch, I think, on this card. Obviously, it's one of the highest profile fights on the card. But, you know, if you were sort of umming and ahhing about whether you're going to tune in, you're going to see something crazy. I, I, I will I will state my reputation on it. Whatever happens in this one, it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be a snooze fest. And, you know, we, we know that from watching both guys. You know, both guys bring it. Uh, you know, I've got to say, both incredibly nice lads as well. You know, you probably hear that a lot from people, but they really are two, uh, you know, two proper gentlemen. Uh, you know, I'm sorry that one of them is not going to have their hand raised. Uh, you know, I think they both earn their spot. They both deserve it. They're both great ambassadors for the sport. And, you know, I guess it's just a case of sticking that professionalism hat on and saying, may the best man win. Indeed it is. And, you know, it's a possible star-making fight as well when you're at the top of a card like this, you know, coming up to Christmas and all that. It's uh, it's, it's a big opportunity for both of them. And uh, as you say, may, may the best man win. Uh, the same would probably be said for the middleweight title fight. Uh, this is a very, very interesting fight. Um, I went back yesterday and watched a good bit of Dario Bellandi and honestly was was very impressed by him. Like, I, I would describe him, I know I described someone last week as a Hector Lombard style. I'm going to describe him as a dad. And Henderson style, you know, he's high guard, stiff, stiff right hand. He and do you know what? One thing with him, he always tries to hurt you. No matter where the fight goes, no matter where you're standing, if you go for a takedown, he'll go for a guillotine. If you come inside with your head down, he'll throw an uppercut at you. Or those little like right hands inside that uh, Alex Pereira was throwing the last day. Like I even saw him going for a go go platter in one of his fights. You know, he's the type of guy he'll just non stop fight, 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 and. Uh, for a middleweight to do that and kind of keep his cardio is is a big thing. And he's fighting Mick Stanton, who, look, we have seen, look, we've seen every part of Mick, I suppose, over the last couple of fights, that five-round fight with Will Curry, where, you know, he was getting taken down and he was using his, uh, uh, using his uh, Kimuras and different things to turn it around and just... There's, there's no beating that man. There's no quitting that man. Like, if there was any bit of quitting you at all, you would have quit with, like, an Adonis, like, Will Curry on top of you constantly, and he just refused. And even the James Webb fight, like, James Webb was doing well in that fight. He came back, okay, like, there's a few questions over the stoppage, but that's nothing got to do with Mick Stanton. He did a great job in that fight, and God almighty, like, this is... I think Mick Stanton, we talked about him before. He was a guy, I suppose... 
you know, in the middle part of his career when he lost uh, to Webb, lost to, you know, what did he last three fights in a row, I think it was? You know, we were like, not not necessarily writing him off, but like thinking, is he going to get to that level in cage wars? Is he going to, you know, move on after, you know, after having success, obviously, earlier in his career? But by God, has he proven it again? You know, he's won, what, six of his last seven fights? This is a, a great time for him, but a great matchup too. And it's a, it's an interesting one, uh, Brad, isn't it? Like, the, the cage warriors title fights rarely disappoint, and I feel like this is another one that could uh, could could be very very good. Yeah, I think um, I think the stat is at middleweight he's won seven in a row now. Like he he took a short notice light heavyweight fight on uh, PFL, I believe it was, uh, which was the only one he dropped. So you know, middleweight Mick Stanton is doing great things at the moment. Like, what are you going to do to this guy? Right? Like, are you going to grapple with him for five rounds like Will Curry did? Well, he can do that. Like, are you going to stand and bang with him like James Webb did? We, you know, he gets dropped to the body, looks like he's about to be finished and, and, and comes back and wins that fight. Like, how do you deal with this guy? And, and I think like the best thing about this sort of Stanton renaissance that, that we've been seeing o- over recent years in Cage Warriors, he just seems really happy. He seems really content. Like, you know, he's got this Cage Warriors title now. And, you know, the, the, the day after, you know, he fights, he's on social media saying, right, who's next? Like he's just really happy with, you know, where he is, he's training, he's competing. He just wants to compete. He wants to fight as often as possible. He wants to get these title defenses in. And, you know, I, I always say a happy fighter is a dangerous fighter. When, when someone's loving what they do as much as he clearly is, um, you know, it's, it's a dangerous uh, proposition to go against. You've got so much experience, high level experience. You know, he's not won them all, uh, but he's won most of them recently. Um but, you know, you, you can't put a price on that experience. And, and I think that may be the key factor in this fight. You know, Dario Bilandi, very, very good fighter. Does he have the same level of, um, you know, the same amount, rather, of high-level experience that Stanton has? And, you know, you have to look at the records and say the answer is no. But by that note, you know, he's not got the wear and tear. He's the young, hungry guy in the come-up. And taking the scalp off Mick Stanton, who's, who's looked so good in his recent fights at middleweight, that's huge. That's huge for Dario Bellandi. All of a sudden, you're in the conversation. All of a sudden, people are saying, well, you know, Christian Leroy Duncan was in charge of that division and now he's in the UFC. Well, now there's another young guy, Dario Bellandi. Obviously, not the same kind of fighter as Christian Leroy Duncan, but, you know, the, the young guy coming through. Um, I think this is going to be a very interesting in terms of the actual styles matchup because Bellandi, you know, makes no bones about the fact that his game plan is to, as you say, just, just bash you up, get you down, um, get those dominant positions on the ground, use his ground game. Is he going to want to go to the ground with Stanton, seeing what Stanton was able to do to a guy like Mick Curry? But then by the same note, the reason that Stanton's improved his ground game to where it is is because early in his career, nobody wanted to stand with him because he's got absolute hammers for fists, right? You know, a lot of uh, a lot of boxing experience before he came over into MMA. And, you know, you look in some of his early fights, his amateur MMA fights, and he's cleaning guys out. So again, like, I don't know what's going to happen in this one. I think... Uh, I think it may be, um, you know, as we've seen in the past, it is going to be decided what, by where Stanton wants to fight. You know, is he going to be happy to go to the ground? Uh, you know, is, is he going to be willing to do what he did with Will Curry in terms of giving his back and looking for those sweeps, you know, where he knew he wasn't maybe going to be able to get the takedowns on Will Curry, but he knew that he could give Will his back and then sweep him. Is he going to be happy to risk that against Balandi, a different kind of ground game? We'll have to wait and see. But yeah, I think it's got... Um, you know, people slate the middleweight division a lot, and you know, I'm not just talking about cage wars. I'm talking about MMA in general. Yeah, you me, know, it's, me a lot. Totally looked on, <laughs> yeah, you, you in particular. Yeah, <laughs> it, you know, it sometimes looks upon you know less favorably, but you know, I'm loving the cage warriors middleweight division at the moment. I think we've had some really good title fights uh, in recent years. You know, Christian Leroy Duncan, James Webb. Uh, Natias Frederick, Mick Stanton, Will Curry. Uh, you know, there's a real cast of characters. And, you know, I'm sure Dario Bellandi is going to want to add his name to the, uh, to that list on Saturday, uh, just as much as Mick's going to want to keep his there. Are we ever going to see Natias Frederick again? He was one of my favourite fighters in cage wars over the last while. It's, uh, it's a pity. It's, he is, I believe, fighting in Levels Fight League at some point. Oh, is he? Oh, good. Uh, That's maybe, good see maybe December. I'm not sure. Um, you know, he's had a bit of time off. Obviously, he's in his, he's in his 40s now. Yeah. Um, and I think he'd sort of said, you know, I'm just going to do a bit of grappling and, and whatnot. But MMA retirements. Indeed. <laughs> Can't wait hard. for his next one. <laughs> oh, but like, he, uh, he, 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 age was the only thing that ever held him back. Like, what a. What a beast of a fighter, like, and it's great to see him back. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if he leveled a few lads out there. But anyway, um, like this, this midway fight, I, like, 
you never, you just never know. You never know what Mick Stanton like. You just never know a young up and going. You know what Belandi said. You mentioned the amateurs earlier on. God Almighty, the amount of amateur fights he has had in, in a short space as well. You know that helps, I suppose, with the experience. And it's a it's a very interesting fight. Like uh, people like giving my picks. I'll probably pick McEwen in the main event. And this one. I, I, I'll pick Mick Stanton out of respect, you know, <laughs> but I really do not know who's going to win this fight. It's a, it's a very interesting one. Um, let's move on, Brandon. We'll, we'll touch on another few fights here. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, Chris Bungard against Perry Goodwin. And look, these are two lads who, if you've been watching the scene for any amount of time altogether, you probably would have come across these two lads. You've probably been at a show where one of these two lads was fighting. Um, and... I think it's a good fight to make at this stage of their careers. Like you look at the likes of you look you look at Perry, the, the likes of the lads he's been in with Jack Grant, Morgan Sharrier, Steve Amy, Bill Reese, McKee, you know, he's done it all, you know, seen it all. And you could say the same for Bungard, you know, fighting, you know, a lot of fights in Bellator, obviously he's coming back fighting George Hardwick, um, and you know, down through the years, Colin Fletcher even the, the and, and, and many more. I uh, you know I, I I love the quote that uh, Chris Bungard said before. Some people fight for silver, another fight for gold, and it it feels like he is trying to do that again. It feels like he's trying to get back there, get on her own, you know, have this fight. This is a fun fight, but still at the same time, maybe in the back of his head, he's thinking, well, I can get back in that mix somehow. And, you know, obviously Perry is from, uh, from the area and, and, and uh, he's fought in that area a good few times, I suppose. This, like, I don't have too much analysis on this one, Brad. I just think this is going to be a fucking a barn, bur- <laughs> a barn burner between two I- lads who want to have a barn burner type of thing. Yeah, this is exactly it. I don't think this fight needs much analysis, to be honest. It's the uh, it's the Ron Seal quick drying wood stain of fights. It does exactly what it says in the tin, right? <laughs> yes. You've got <laughs> you've got two guys who just want to have a tear up, you know, they, and they love it, and that's what you're going to see. You know, they they, they both they both get it. You know, they they um they understand that fans want to be entertained, and they go out there and they have entertaining fights. They put it all on the line, uh, and and they enjoy doing so. You know, um, both great in all areas you know both guys uh, fantastic ground game uh, both guys happy to stand in the pocket and brawl both guys got good boxing uh, I don't understand how this fight could possibly be boring um, I think it's um, you know it's opening the main card for a reason you know Ian Dean always likes to put a bit of uh, bit of fireworks on to open the main card and, and I don't think it's uh, any coincidence that that's, this is exactly where we see in this fight um, two great guys great to see Perry back you know I, th- I think it's it's been like three years since he fought in Cage Warriors. You know, he's had a had a bit of a hiatus from MMA. I know he, he had a couple of fights uh, on the regional scene. Um, you know, he, he lost to Thomas Paul, uh, but he got a, a sick knockout before that uh, on the regional scene. Um, you know, he, he's he's always been in fantastic fights. That fight with Reese McKee was absolutely insane. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Like I say, it's uh, it's opening the main card for a reason. So uh, do not uh, do not blink. It's going to be wild. Indeed, and I'd say the other fight will probably be on the main card is Darren Stewart against uh, Antonio Zovac. Obviously, Darren Stewart was supposed to fight uh, a couple of weeks ago. That that didn't end up happening. You know, we 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 gave a good breakdown of Darren Stewart's game a couple of weeks ago, I suppose. So maybe we won't, we won't do that again. But he's on a three fight win streak. The middleweight title is on this card. Look, if he wins this fight, I I don't think it'll take a rocket science to know what's next for him. Uh, I wa- I tried to watch a bit of Antonio uh, Zovac, and I know it's a bit out. So maybe, maybe whoever done the same yet but the only two clips I've been able to find of him are uh, a less than two minute fight where he gets choked out and a kickboxing match where he gets knocked out in about three minutes but you look at his record and you know he's eight knockouts in nine wins so they're definitely power in hands he definitely has experience kickboxing too but look on short notice and everything like that we'll, we'll see how it goes but for him it's a big opportunity coming in against uh, someone like uh, like Darren Shore. maybe you have a little bit more info on him Brad but like for th- this is this is a fight I suppose to get Darren Stewart out there put him in prime position I suppose to be, to be the next in line and he was probably I'd say he was probably anti Indian and mad to get a fight on this card was he? Yeah you know he, he wanted to fight you know he's, he's had such bad luck with uh, with opponents you know and it always seems to happen when he's fighting in London he's you know opponents are injured or not medically cleared or, or whatever it is it's, it's, it's just rotten luck and look People aren't exactly queuing up to fight Darren Stewart, right? You know, he's he had a, you know, a bit of an up and down time in the UFC, but, you know, 14, 15 fights in, in the UFC, 
And this sort of evolved Darren Stewart that we're seeing now with this wrestling game, and you know, he's happy to use it. You know, he, I don't know if you called it, but he, he jumped on the broadcast with us in London last weekend. And, um, you know, we, we were talking about, I, I think we were just talking about the main event and who needed to do what. And Stuart's advice was uh, for any fighters, just go in there, run the clock down, get on top of the guy, kill kill the clock, <laughs> kill the minute. So he was like, you know what? I don't care anymore. I'm out there to win for me. He's like, you know, the fa- the fans aren't bothered when uh, when you lose. So uh, so why should you be bothered? Um, and that's, you know, that makes it an interesting prospect as well, because now we know he's got this crazy ground game. People are now just like, oh, no, I don't want to stand with Darren Stewart, but I also don't want to be stuck underneath him for three rounds, getting my head bashed in either. So it's like, which Darren Stewart are we going to see? I, I think we're going to see those takedowns. Um, yeah, as you say, Zovac, uh, he, he does kickbox outside of MMA. So, you know, multi-sport athlete and he's a banger. You know, uh, he, he either finishes fights or he's getting finished. So I, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a wild one. I think he's going to come out. You know, he's taking this on short notice. He's going to come out. He's going to try and take Darren Stewart's head off early. And I think Stewart's going to pick his moment, look for the takedowns and see what he can do from top position. Can't wait for it. Brad, run us through the undercard. What, what stands out to you? I know at the time of recording, there's a few fights that are in the works, not quite made by the time it comes out. Maybe there's there, there's something else. Uh, the one that stands out to me is Dan Juice versus Aiden Steven. Uh, Orlando Prince is on the card as well. Jack Elgin on the card. What? what Tell us about a few of those fighters on the undercard that people maybe tune into Cage Warriors undercard maybe for the first time should be looking out for. Yeah, well, like, as I say, we've got uh, we've got roughly twenty fights on the card, so there's going to be early prelims, prelims, and then the main card. So it's going to be a huge night of action, and whatever you're into in terms of MMA, there, there will be something for you on this card. Um, Dan Dives versus uh, Aiden Stephen, uh, as you mentioned there, that's a really interesting one. Um, you know, Aiden's had a bit of time on the sidelines. Uh, been able to he- heal up a few injuries. Uh, just become a father as well. So uh, congratulations to him on that. Uh, Liam Gittins as well recently became a father. So congratulations to the lads all around. They've got a new generation of cage warriors coming through. Um, but yeah, that should be a great fight. Aiden, uh, not only coming back from sort of a, a long hiatus, but moving down to bantamweight as well. So very interested to see uh, how he looks. I mean, physically, he looks in incredible shape. You know, we were all thinking like, wow, how's, how's he going to make bantam weight? But he's, you know, he's taken this time off, used it well. You know, he's not crash dieting to get there. He's, he's completely changed his, his body and he, he looks fantastic. So very interested to see. We all know how good of a grappler he is. Uh, Dan Douse is a BJJ purple belt. So hoping we see some nice ground exchanges uh, between those two. So really looking forward to that. And you mentioned again, Jack Eglin, uh, always great value for money. He's taken on Enrico Di Gagne, uh, another top prospect coming out of Italy. So that's a real uh, Ian Dean special, that one, two, uh, two highly touted prospects uh, going at it on the undercard. Uh, and, and I guess like, you know, from a narrative point of view, uh, we've got to talk about the return of Kennedy Freeman. Of course, the, the daughter of Ian the Machine Freeman, um, British MMA legend, the first... Uh, Englishman ever to compete in the UFC. Um, so, you know, a huge legacy there. You know, her, her nickname is The Machine 2.0. She's trained by her father for many, many years. Um, she's been away from MMA for about, I want to say, five or six years now. So she's she, she went down the sort of pro boxing route, um, but she's sort of, she's kept a hand in. She's coaching uh, at the gym now. She's coaching kids. Um, and she's decided she wants another run at it. You know, she's still in her, I uh, believe she's in her mid-20s. Um, so she's you know, still very, very much got the time, uh, you know, to make something of it. And she's, you know, she's undefeated. Uh, she had a big amateur record. I think she only had one loss as an amateur as well. She was just running through people and undefeated as a pro. So, you know, there's no reason why she can't get a couple of fights under her belt. And then, you know, maybe next summer she's looking at the contender series, but you know, a, a, a big, um, a big legacy that she's she's bringing up with her. Obviously, there will always be that you know comparison when you, you you've got a father who's you know not just a great uh, fighter but a, a trendsetter and a pioneer for the the entire scene. You know, Ian was fighting back in the nineties. Um, so yeah, I'm sure a lot of pressure on the shoulders coming back after all that time off. But from what I remember of her fights previously, uh, she's definitely got the shoulders to deal with it. She's a very very good fighter. Frank Mir's daughter is fighting as well, isn't she? So, uh, you know, that story right hey, there. There we down, go. Down the line. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like we need to put a pin in this preview show and come back to this because maybe that was a call in, in a few years' time. You'd never know. Uh, Brad, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, best look on the show this weekend. 
and uh, have a great Christmas too I suppose and we'll be, we'll be talking again in the uh, in the new year about whatever Ian Dean and Graham Bylan have planned for the for the madness of of, uh, of cage warriors then it's it'll uh, well it'll fans uh, <laughs> no, can't give anything away obviously but fans may want to uh, keep a keep a close eye on the broadcast and you might be finding out exactly uh when and where some of our, our conversations Ooh, next year will be uh, I love will be emanating from. I love so it. big big things to come. Uh, twenty twenty four been a busy year this year, and and there's uh, yeah there's only going to be more to come. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Brad. Thank you to everybody for tuning in. Check out Cage Warriors on UFC Fight Pass this Saturday night. No tickets are left, so maybe, maybe you'll be lucky, maybe for over Newcastle. Try it out. But uh, UFC Fight Pass Cage Warriors Saturday night. We leave it there. On my name is Sean Sheen for Sherdog.com. and we'll see you all next time.